peoples, including Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux peoples. Now just a couple of housekeeping items. This event is being live streamed and we ask that you put your phones on silent. After the presentation, there will be a few minutes for a question and answer period. There are two microphones available, so please use those when you ask your question so that all can hear. And if we don't get to your question or if you have follow-up thoughts for today, then please feel free to send them to President Lorman using his email, president at concordia.ab.ca. There is a class in this room at one o'clock, so we are asked to vacate this room by one so that that class is not delayed. And finally, students who are in attendance today are eligible to be entered for prizes if you submit your entry by 1.15 p.m. today, just outside of the auditorium. Prizes include tuition credits and bookstore gift certificates. Winners will be contacted by email. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Concordia University of Edmonton's President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Tim Lorman. Dr. Lorman is Concordia's eighth president and vice chancellor. He has been at Concordia since 2003 and has served as a professor in the Faculty of Education as well as Dean of Research and Faculty Development and vice president academic and provost. Before joining Concordia, Dr. Lorman was on faculty at Monash University in Australia where he completed his PhD. Prior to that, he was an elementary and junior high school teacher in Australia and Edmonton. His active research interests include inclusive education and pedagogy, having published a number of books and peer-reviewed journal articles in these areas, along with presenting at major international conferences. His research work has attracted funding from major local and international granting agencies and has been recognized in a number of awards from academic publishers and community groups. He was the recipient of Concordia's President's Research Award in 2016. In 2010, he was a Senior Visiting Research Fellow at the University of Bologna in Italy, and since then he has held visiting professorships at the Hong Kong Institute for Education and Queen's University Belfast. Dr. Lorman was founding editor of the International Jun Journal of Whole Schooling and recently completed a term as co-editor of Exceptionality Education International. So without further ado, I give you the President and Vice Chancellor of Concordia University of Edmonton, Dr. Lorman. Well, welcome to the State of Uni the University Address for 2019. I'm going to use the next 45 minutes to provide you with a fairly high-level snapshot of where things stand at Concordia University of Edmonton at this point of, in time. Uh, I would like to um, acknowledge that I don't create this address alone. I have a very hard-working team that has helped me with this, uh, and with that in mind, I need to acknowledge the work of our Vice Presidents, our Registrar, uh, and others who've made important contributions. So these people are our VPA and Provost, Dr. Valerie Hennetuk, and her team, our Registrar, Dr. Andreas Gulzo, our VP Student Life and Learning, Dr. Barb Van Ingen, who you just heard from, our VP External Affairs and International Relations, Dr. Manfred Zoik, who was unfortunately not able to join us today. He's in Finland. Uh, and our Vice President Finance and Operations, uh, Mr. Rizwan Kanji, who's here today. Uh, Mr. Judy Kruzi and Mrs. Lana Kuzik were also instrumental in helping put this event together. And I'd be very remiss if I didn't uh, mention our student help, uh, student employee Emma Grant, who did the PowerPoint presentation. So that's her work up there. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of our VIPs here today. You're all VIPs at Concordia, but these are VVIPs, I guess. Um, we have, from our board, uh, we have uh, Russ, Mr. Russ Morrow, who's the chair of our board of governors, along with our chancellor, Mr. Stephen Mandel. Uh, we have Jonathan Strand, who's on our board. I, don't, I did see Jonathan come in, but I don't know where he is. And I can't see because of the lights. But um, We have our Lions, I believe, who's here from our board. Uh, David Kepler, John Atchison, are there any others from our board? Did I miss anyone? No, I don't think so. Karen. Oh, Karen Leibovici's here. Hi, Karen. Uh, 
We also have some uh, important friends of Concordia. We have uh, our local MLA, Janice Irwin, who's here. So thank you, Janice, for coming. Along with her office staff, Sally Scott. Uh, we have Jeff Cook from NBF uh, Financial Services, Angus Watt Financial Services. Good to see you, Jeff. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have Aileen uh, Giesbrecht from the City of Edmonton. I don't know if Aileen's here. Is she here? Okay, she's not here. Uh, Stephen Prenderville, Amanda Radakovic from Norquest College. Amanda, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have uh, Sandra Robertson from External Relations uh, in Post-Secondary at the City of Edmonton. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, we have um, a number of Concordia faculty members here, of course, and staff members. And we have uh, Dr. Marilyn Westbury, who is a Professor Emeritus and a former Dean here at, at Concordia. Many of you will remember Marilyn, so welcome uh, to all of you. Um, so I started doing this State of the University address two years ago, and on both previous occasions I had nothing but good news to report. Uh, this included, amongst any, uh, many other accomplishments, the adoption of a learning outcomes approach to our curriculum, the completion of our academic plan, the construction of our new Alan Wakowicz Centre, and high levels of student satisfaction and engagement. And this picture has not changed this year, I'm pleased to report. Indeed, if anything, we've moved from strength to strength. Now, if one were to outline the markers of a successful university, I believe that Concordia would satisfy each one of them. We have a strong, caring faculty and staff. We're a university of first choice for many students. Our enrolments are at a historic high. We're engaged with Indigenous communities and in the process of reconciliation to a much greater extent than previous. Uh, our research engagement is up. Our graduates are successful. Our alumni are proud. And we've made meaningful international connections and have an enviable record of service and extension. Our athletics teams are successful. Our artistic endeavours are highly rated and we've maintained top-class facilities. Our great reputation has resulted in positive media attention, so by those measures, Concordia is already Canada's preeminent small university, as the sign says. In the, past, I want to begin, I, I, in the past, I began with some information on student satisfaction from the Canadian University Survey Consortium, and I'm going to do that again today. These surveys provide comparative information on the Canadian university experience. The surveys run in a three-year rotation, alternating between surveys of first-year students, middle-year students, and graduating students. And Concordia has participated in these sur surveys annually for just over 10 years, I believe. Results of the 2019 survey of first-year students were released this summer, and they allow us to see how we compare to the average for the 46 participating Canadian institutions, and also to ourselves from our own past performance. Uh, and that last survey was conducted in 2016 of first year students. So what stands out is the positive view our students have of this university. Concordia's students' ratings often exceed ratings given by students nationally, particularly for questions about their overall perception of the university and their experiences with faculty and with staff. Now, as this figure here shows, 86% of Concordia student respondents said that they're satisfied or very satisfied with how the university shows concern to students as individuals. And this compares to 73% nationally. So this is on par with what our students reported in 2016. So despite our massive growth, we have not lost that individual uh, attention piece to our work. Concordia students were also 1.6 times more likely than their Canadian counterparts to report that they are very satisfied on this question. In 2016, 93% of Concordia respondents said that they're satisfied or very satisfied with their decision to attend Concordia. We now have 95% saying that they're satisfied or very satisfied with this decision, and this rating is slightly higher than the national average. In 2019, 88% of our students reported that the university met or exceeded their expectations which is comparable to students nationally, but lower by four percentage points than our 2016 survey results for this question. Of note is that Concordia students are more likely to say that their experience exceeded their expectations, with 26% of Concordia students reporting this, compared to 21% nationally. 
I just saw our Chancellor Emeritus, the Honourable Alan Wackerwich, walk in, so I'd like to say welcome, uh, Chancellor Emeritus Wackerwich. In terms of students' inclination to promote their university to others, when asked on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is not likely at all and 10 is extremely likely, 30% of our student, 38% sorry, of our students gave a rating of 9 or 10, making them very likely to be promoters of this university compared to 33% nationally. And in 2019, taking into consideration all of their professors and courses, 92% of our students said that they were generally satisfied with the quality of teaching they received. This is comparable to our 2016 respondents' answers at 91% and higher than the 2019 responses of students nationally, which was 88%. Now, notably, 24% of Concordia students said that they were very satisfied, which is one and a half, and a half times higher than the Canadian average of 16%. So the survey asked a set of 15 questions uh, about students' perceptions of their professors. In 11 of those questions, our students' 2019 satisfaction ratings exceeded those of students nationally. Students' agreement with the statement that most of my professors treat students as individuals, not just numbers, is one example. And that's what we really pride ourselves on here at Concordia. As shown here, a full 92% of our students agree with this statement, which is two percentage points higher than responses provided by Concordia students in 2016, and well above the national average of 78%. Concordia student respondents are also very positive in their assessment of teaching assistants and support staff. In 2019, 91% of Concordia students reported that they agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that most teaching assistants are helpful if you've got assistant in your title, maybe you should be helpful. That's kind of a signal. And this figure for Concordia's respondents is higher than in 2016 and above the 2019 national average by 11 points. I'll now turn to our Board of Governors. Our board continues to function very well under the leadership of our board chair, Mr Russ Morrow, who I introduced earlier. He successfully completed his first year in the post. Now, our board is comprised, and people don't often know this, of very dedicated volunteers, and they selflessly donate their time and their expertise to our institution to help us move forward. So they're not paid for this work, and they do a lot of work and put in a lot of hours. One of these volunteers is our Chancellor, Stephen Mandel. Now, Chancellor Mandel returned to this role on July 1, following the Alberta election. Uh, and we are so glad to have such an engaged Chancellor and a supportive person back with us. So, nice to have you back and thank you. This year our board resolved a significant issue which had become known as the public-private question, which I actually don't hear very much anymore. Uh, this question had been in the foreground of many conversations for years. The Board of Governors did its due diligence in investigating what a shift to becoming a fully public institution might entail. Working with the Government of Alberta and other post-secondary secondary institution presidents, we determined that the drawbacks of becoming fully public outweighed the benefits at that point in time. And so the Board of Governors elected to keep Concordia as an independent academic institution. And this decision is a good one because it now allows us to move forward. Our Board is also cognizant of the change our institution is undergoing through increased enrolment and the demands that are placed on our institution. The Board is taking steps to ensure that we have adequate resources set aside to accommodate the increase in students and is working with administration to collate our various plans into a single overarching document that addresses the future direction of Concordia in terms of academics, growth, research, finances and facilities. Now since Concordia's academic plan 2018 to 23 was approved by GFC, all units of cross campus had been busy developing their first five-year implementation plans and then providing a first annual report on progress to our Vice President, Academic and Provost. Now, the, the VPs for Academic Student Life and Learning and External Affairs and International Relations have also produced executive summaries of the implementation plans for their respective areas, which are available alongside the academic plan on our public website. Given our mandate for growth towards the sweet spot, apparently, of 4,000 headcount or 3,000 full load equivalent students, our enrolment figures are very positive, indicating that students are choosing Concordia in significant numbers. Of course, such increased student numbers do raise challenges 
in terms of our physical plant and our staffing. Further, as an institution, we need to be asking what our student body should look like overall. Do we need a balance of graduate and undergraduate students, domestic and international students? How do we balance the size of various faculties? And we need to develop appropriate enrolment controls. We're at that point now. Accordingly, deliberate and proactive planning is becoming increasingly necessary. So our registrar is now chairing a new strategic enrolment management committee. And this is kind of an ad hoc working committee of the GFC. Now one vital response to the growth is already well underway, of course, and this is new faculty hiring to meet the needs of our growing programs. I'm pleased to announce the following new academic colleagues have joined Concordia as of this academic year. In arts, we welcome Carmen Arth in psychology, Trevor Cook in English, Mai Hussain in French, and Paulina Johnson in Indigenous Studies. In education, we welcome Christine Martineau as a new faculty member, and Stephanie Radomsky as our new field experiences coordinator. And in science, we welcome Cecilia Bukutu, who is our Director of Public Health, and Cecilia previously worked here at Concordia with us as our Director of Institutional Research. We have Emmanuel Matfumo in Environmental Science, Baida Saha in IT. And we're also happy to announce our new, announce our new scholarly communications librarian, Victoria Eck. Management hires will come on board later. Still in progress is our hire into the position of Doctor of Psychology Director. With the growth noted above, faculty hiring will need to remain an area of focus in coming years. It might help to provide an update on the financial aid and scholarships that Concordia is able to offer our students. In 2018-19, Concordia awarded 251 merit scholarships financed with institutional funds. We dispersed nearly $400,000. An additional 72 donor-funded awards were awarded with a disbursement of almost $75,000. Our bursary program resulted in a disbursement of about $120,000, divided into 139 different bursaries. Of these, 40% were donor-funded. In addition, Concordia dispersed nearly $125,000 in institutionally funded Thunder Athletic Scholarships and $7,000 in donor-funded athletics awards. So, in all, we have 551 unique recipients receiving a total of 603 awards from the Alberta Heritage Scholarship Program, with a total dispersed value of nearly $900,000. <coughs> Another 39 external awards valued at $132,000 flowed through student <coughs> accounts from other outside sources. So lots of money going to support our students here. And let's have a look at those students through our <coughs> enrolment picture. Concordia University of Edmonton's overall enrolment continues to grow rapidly, well above the target set in the academic plan, which was 5% growth per year. And when you're setting a 5% growth target, you're thinking, gee, I wonder if we'll be able to make that every year, but perhaps on average that'll be something we can do. Um, th this uh, presentation was prepared some time ago, but I can now report that our growth in full load equivalent students uh, this fall was 23%. Um, and that follows a year last year, which I believe was something around 12%, 11 or 12%. So we've had two or three years of very significant growth here. The growth shown in the following graph here, uh, these are the numbers, uh, the enrolment numbers in all provincially approved programs. Uh, they do not include enrolment in any certificate or diploma programs. So the 2019-20 value is our registrar's current prediction, or was his current prediction, based on the fall 2019 uh, registrations. And now we'll look into the detail, and I believe we hit somewhere pretty close to that. Now we'll look into the details of our various programs. So the following two charts show the enrolment for our LERS reported graduate programs. The first overall and then by specific program. For fall 2019, Concordia has admitted a record number of students to our MISM and MISAM programs, and this resulted in the large increase. Both of our after-degree programs, the Bachelor of Environmental Health and the Bachelor of Education, saw a relatively steady enrolment. Uh, in 2018-19, our Bachelor of Education switched to three cohorts instead of the uh, previous two, and this significantly increases our enrolment, obviously, in that uh, program. 
Our first degree undergraduate student programs have been primarily responsible for the significant increase in enrolment over the years. We're now expecting another significant increase in undergraduate enrolment. Uh, our applications for winter are up by 55%. Um, so things are going quite well. I'll now address our financial picture. Concordia had a very good year from a financial perspective. We finished the year ending March 31, 2019 with an operating surplus of $4.7 million, which is a $3 million increase over the prior year's net operating surplus of $1.7 million. And this increased surplus was driven by higher student enrolment while still managing our costs. Concordia, now you may think, wow, we got tons of money, that's, that's a great thing, and it is. But Concordia must run an annual surplus, and we need this to ensure financial health and to fund our future growth. As an independent academic institution, we do not receive funds for capital projects from the Government of Alberta. The directive of our Board of Governors is that surplus operating funds are to be applied to capital projects. In addition to operating surplus grants and external financing, they must all be secured to fund capital projects. The Alan Wakowicz Centre for Science, Research and Innovation is one example of this. Uh, we pay for that through a mixture of government grants uh, from the federal government, our surplus and financing from the Bank of Montreal. Now, during the 2018-19 year, revenue grew by 11.8%, which equates to $3.8 million. So the university had a 17% increase in tuition revenue resulting from more students coming here, increased enrolment. Government operational funding increased by 2% for the year and that represented 37.4% of our revenue. Tuition and, and government operating funding combined represent 89.8% of our revenue. And this is a problem. With such a heavy reliance on just two revenue streams, the university will uh, can face difficulties. So we're going to try to continue to find additional revenue streams to support us should one of these revenue streams dry up at some point in the future. So total expenses for the year ending March 31, 2019 was $31.1 million. And that was an increase of 2.6% or $787,000 from the prior year. So this increase in costs is primarily due to an increase in interest on our debt and amortisation costs related to our new Alan Michaelwich Centre. Salary and benefits accounted for nearly 70% of all operational expenses. Salaries and wages increased by 3.2%, and this increase is driven by both increases in staffing as well as increases in compensation. A total of 10 positions were added, and as these positions were hired throughout the course of the year, the full value of their salaries and wages will be realised in this financial year. Capital expenditures in fiscal 2019 totaled $3.7 million, and this was a decrease in $8.4 million from the prior year. Most of the capital expenditure relates to the completion of our Alan Wakowicz Centre. Our first quarter of fiscal 2020 sees an operating surplus of $586,000, and this is nearly a million dollars better than our first quarter deficit of $235,000 last year. The increase in operating surplus is due to increased enrolment. Enrolment for the fall winter is looking good and at this juncture we'll proceed with the current budget plan and with fiscal restraint being strongly encouraged as there is current uncertainty around government funding. I turn now to student life and learning. Concordia's student life and learning team are amazing. They help our students in ways that enable them to fully engage in their studies through facilitating learning accommodations, career counselling, psychological counselling, academic strategising, and any number of other supports. And this is really central to what we do at Concordia. And our reputation for caring about individual students is enhanced by the work of our student life and learning team. In 2018, the Student Life and Learning Unit engaged in its first self-study. And this is modelled after the academic cyclical reviews that our departments are used to doing and it received positive feedback on the dedication and extraordinary work of the Student Life and Learning team members. Concordia's excellent student services are centralised in the Student Success Centre, and uh, as I said uh, a year ago, we wanted that to be a destination where our students can find a variety of services they can access all in one place, and it's proven to be this place. It's an intentional Apple Store design uh, with available staff, but not with the expensive gadgets, 
um, and this is where the services can come out to our students. We've also discovered that students feel so comfortable in this space that they choose to study and hang out in there, which is totally fine too. In 2018-19, our athletics season was a year filled with improvements and success for the Thunder. Top 15 CCAA national rankings, that's the Canadian uh, version of the ACAC, national rankings were commonplace for our teams. And the women's and men's soccer, men's basketball, golf, cross-country running, curling and badminton teams all spent time ranked alongside the best in Canada throughout their respective seasons. The golf, badminton, curling and cross-country teams all made trips to the CCAA national championships and across the AC and CCW AA, nine of our 12 teams qualified for conference national championships or playoffs and achieved the following results and recognitions. So Kennedy Turcott won a silver medal at the ACAC Women's Golf Championships with the women's golf team finishing as bronze medalists. And then at the CCAA National Championships, the women's team finished seventh overall in the whole country. That's really good. Mind you, you know, it, it is just golf. <laughs> the men's golf team had their best showing in nearly 10 years and they finished as ACAC team silver medalists and at the national championships they finished 11th overall. In the first ever ACAC mixed, mixed golf team championships, the Thunder placed as bronze medalists and they were only two strokes out of first place. Rookie Leonard Chesu, who you might have seen featured in the newspaper, uh, finished as a silver medalist at the ACAC Cross Country Running Championship. He beat uh, some Olympic marathon runners in a local race uh, a couple months ago. Um, so while the men's team finished fifth overall, so Leonard would go on to earn a silver medal at the national championships. So whoever beat him was a real legend. Um, and it won't last because this year he'll get a gold medal. The women's cross-country running team finished as ACAC bronze medalist and 10th overall at the, in the national championships. And men's, the men's basketball team finished with an ACAC silver medal after a tuss, tough loss in the conference championship finals to Sate. A surprising loss too, actually. Coach Reagan Wood was awarded ACAC men's basketball coach of the year and was a finalist for the national version of that. Uh, Fifth-year student-athlete Ryan McLaren was ACAC Men's Basketball Player of the Year and a nominee for the National Player of the Year. The men's curling team won the ACAC Championship for the second straight year and went on to win Concordia's first ever National Championship in curling. Yes, yeah, great. They hurried hard. Uh, head coach <laughs> Taina Smiley was recognised as the Curling Canada Coach of the Year. And the badminton team... Uh, as expected, um, won their first ACAC team championships in seven years uh, with sibling duo of Takesha and Desmond Wang winning the mixed doubles event. They probably didn't even break a sweat. Um, their success, this success carried over to the national championship where the Wangs would win their second straight national title while Nicholas Pittman finished with a silver medal in men's singles. Head coach Kevin McAlpine was named ACAC Coach of the Year, while both Takesha and Desmond were named the ACAC and National Female and Male Players of the Year, respectively. Uh, so in total, the Thunder had 16 ACAC All-Conference recipients, five National All-Canadians, five National Academic All-Canadians, 38 ACAC Academic Athletes Awards, and 28 National Scholar recipients. So the 2019-20 season looks very promising as the Thunder teams, and we are particularly excited about hosting, uh, which is coming up, uh, the 2019 National Women's Soccer Championships here um, in November, which is a huge risk <laughs> in Edmonton. I hope they're bringing their long pants. On the sports front too, we have a nice partnership that we've developed with FC Edmonton, the professional uh, soccer team here in Edmonton. And uh, we have signed an agreement with them for a partnership. And you may have noticed, I believe it was last week, uh, that during the He For She event, we had FC Edmonton uh, out on a uh, kind of practice game uh, with our um, um, uh, women's uh, soccer team. So that's a very nice partnership we have there too. In September 2018, we launched 
the Concordia Commitment Program. And this was based on a successful program at the University of Regina. This supports students throughout the university experience and beyond. And we had an excellent first year. We had 16 students continue on to the second year of this program. And we'd eventually like to see many more students take up this opportunity, perhaps numbering even in the hundreds. But we recognise that we have to start somewhere and we think we're off to a pretty good start. I mentioned last year that the commitment has five elements and given that we're still trying to actively promote participation in the program, these elements are worth revisiting this year. So the first one is to connect. Students are connected with an advisor. The second one is to learn. Students are given assistance to adjust to university courses and demands through academic skills workshops. The third is to engage. So students get, are required to get more involved in campus life. They are to explore, attending a range of academic seminars and presentations, and starting their career through building a thoughtful career plan. Now, if students complete we all know this, I think, but it bears repeating. If students complete the program and they have a 2.3 GPA at the end, not hard to get, uh, and they do not secure career-related employment in the first six months that they are uh, out, of, out from Concordia, they can come back for free and study tuition-free for a year. Um, but they're not going to have to because they will all be so successful and working and happy. Um, that's the plan. Uh, Campus mental health is also an important issue for us. Last year we lost another student to suicide and many more live with crippling mental health issues. We are committed to doing everything in our power to reverse this trend. In September 2017, we launched our mental health strategy and this was a decisive commitment to mental health and wellness in the Concordia community. In 2017-18, the mental health action team selected three priorities for the year and in the 2018-19, five additional priorities were selected. So the original three include the creation of a peer support team, movies for mental health events, and a mental health first aid training for all interested, in faculty, all interested faculty and staff. And I'm pleased to say that as of now, we have approximately, this is quite an amazing number, 130 faculty and staff trained in mental health first aid. Um, it's a two-day course, it's a really big commitment and so thank you to all those people who've done it and if you haven't done it, it's an outstanding course and there'll be some opportunities this year, I think, to take that. Um, that means that these faculty and staff are now more confident to work with and engage with someone who's experiencing an acute mental health problem or crisis. So the 2018-19 priorities were to strengthen our targeted mental health supports uh, for Indigenous students, and we've done this through our Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre. We have been collaborating with fellow Edmonton Regional Post-Secondary uh, Student Mental Health Committee members, offering an Inquiring Minds program to students, faculty and staff to help build resilience and wellness. We've enhanced our support during critical transition times for all members of the campus community through a collaboration with the Edmonton Regional Post-Secondary Mental Health Committee partners. That's a very long name committee. You should have some sort of acronym that no one can pronounce. Um, we are promoting web-based self-screening programs via our My Wellness Student Plan and via LifeWorks for employees. And we're promoting broad-based training and guidance on compliance with policy and legislative requirements through the creation of the Policy Coordination Committee and Educational Programming. And these initiatives are all funded through the Sean O'Brien Mental Health Fund and the annual President's Fundraiser Breakfast for Mental Health. The Mental Health Action Team selected four new priorities for the 2019-20 academic year. And they are to develop anti-stigma initiatives, to increase the availability of programming and training for students, faculty and staff to help build resilience and wellness, to increase awareness of early alert programming for students who are academically at risk, and working with advanced education, Alberta Health Services and external partner organisations to provide 24-hour access to mental health resources on campus and within the community. With respect to our Indigenous strategy, Concordia is making efforts to build and deepen relationships with Indigenous communities and we have developed good partnerships with Cold Lake First Nations and the Métis Nation of Alberta. And in September we were pleased to receive a $250,000 endowment from the Métis Education Fund towards a larger $500,000 endowment 
to support Métis student scholarships here at Concordia. The goals and initiatives, we matched it, that's how I got the $500,000. The goals and initiatives related to our Indigenous strategy are guided by our Elders Council and they're done in collaboration with our Indigenous Students Council and the Indigenous community. So since opening, there's some pretty amazing numbers for you about to follow. Since opening our Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre in August of 2018, we have hosted 35 programs that have seen 1,647 participants. There, these programs included Indigenous focused training, sharing circles, presentations by Indigenous scholars and community leaders, ceremonies, medicine picking, soup and bannock, which always seems to be a very popular event, um, teaching with our elders and more. In addition to Indigenous focused programs, our IKRC became a home away from home for many of our Indigenous students on campus. Through the IKRC, Indigenous students access support in funding applications, academic planning, emotional support, advocacy, internal and external referrals for cultural and emergency supports, volunteer experience and other opportunities to engage in our campus life. Now, as tradition dictates, when you commit to hosting a round dance, it's a minimal commitment of four years. However, Concordia will continue to host round dances long into the future. We hosted our first round dance in October 2017, and we welcomed approximately 300 guests. We were surprised by the number of people who turned up. So in September 2018, we had it in the gym, and we celebrated with over 500 people. Our round dance inspires joy and happiness and is a display of kinship and harmony with our Indigenous brothers and sisters. I would like to extend an invitation to everyone here to our round dance, which is this Saturday, uh, October the 5th, in our gym, and it's, the feast starts at 5. It's free, so come, have fun. It is fun. I hope to see all of you there. The IKRC continues to develop and enhance services to Indigenous students and to all students, faculty and staff who are welcome to participate in the programming. And this coming year, you'll find opportunities to engage in learning around topics such as historic and intergenerational trauma, Métis history and culture, the Inuk experience, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and the 60s scoop. With respect to fine arts, Concordia operated as a fringe venue this year. This auditorium actually was a fringe venue, hosting a theatre piece called Bluebirds. Uh, and this was created by a group called Wishbone Theatre uh, with Concordia faculty members, Glenda Sterling and Josiah Heemstra, who's controlling the microphone and lighting here, so hi. Uh, and also the, petition, the participation of many Concordia students. Concordia students who were acting and, and others supporting. It opened to very positive reviews. Uh, I went and saw it. It was a beautiful, relevant theatre piece that honoured women who served our country in war. And these stories are so often ignored in our heroic national narratives. Our winter musical, the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, was also well received, featuring a large cast and a production crew of Concordia students. In music, we had a number of events on campus, including handbell and orchestral performances. Warming up for their tour of China next year, our concert choir ironically braved four days of white skies, rain, and even blizzard-like conditions in northern Alberta on their When the Sun Comes tour. <laughs> the choir sang for the communities of Westlock, Slave, Dawson Creek, Slave Lake, Dawson Creek, Grand Prairie and Valley View before a home concert here in Edmonton. With respect to our international uh, strategy, almost eight years into our program, we continue to deepen and intensify our cooperation with our world partners. So Concordia has expanded agreements with the European Erasmus Plus Scholarship Program by invitation from partners in Spain, Germany, Portugal, Poland, and recently Athens in Greece, and Salamanca in Spain. Italy, Bulgaria, Finland, and another Spanish university are in the pipeline for future Erasmus Plus cooperation. Now, through this program, we've been able to send a dozen, over a dozen, faculty, staff, and students abroad to our partners, paid for by the Erasmus Plus program, not by Concordia. And in return, we've welcomed them as guests to Concordia. So we are now the most active Erasmus Plus partner among all 26 post-secondary institutions in Alberta. I'm really proud of that. That's a testament to how engaged we are with the international community. We're in conversation with universities who are interested in partnering with Concordia in Italy, and they are in Florence and Udine, both of which have horrible football teams, I will add. Uh, Hungary, 
not the universities perhaps, but the cities, uh, Hungary uh, in Budapest and Ghent in Belgium. Our study abroad program is still a challenge, but we have sent approximately 20 students to study abroad in 2019, and we'd really like to see this increase in 2020. Our very first double degrees are underway. Three Concordia students have gone to Beijing in China, and they're going to be there for the short period of two years. Uh, they're doing a one year plus two years plus one year double degree in management. Uh, and this is supported with a full and very generous uh, scholarship from the government of China. Uh, we're still working on the launch of our French double degrees with the University of Southern Brittany in France. Our Centre for Innovation and Applied Research in the Alan Wachowicz Centre is expanding and working on several new ventures with industry. After a mission to Brazil in April this year, the CIAR is working on international cooperation with industry and partners from Brazil. The newly created Centre for Applied Artificial Intelligence is also working on several projects in cooperation with community and industry. We're having talks on cooperation with other post-secondary institutions in Alberta uh, and AMI for cooperation in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The newly established Office of Extension and Culture, and I see the director, uh, Dr. Xin Xin Fang, is here. Um, it now directs all non-credit activities at Concordia. And these are from the orchestra and choir to non-credit courses, martial arts, and workshops for entrepreneurship, leadership, and IT security. Our concert choir, as I said, is heading to China in 2020, and our drama group will be heading to Brazil in 2021. The choir has been visiting partners since 2014 in Brazil and Europe, um, and so the next after China, we think, will be Northern Europe. Our internationalisation also means global awareness on campus. We've increased our cultural events, such as Chinese New Year, Holly, Diwali, Brazil Day, and Africa Day. Concordia cultivates an increasing friendship with the heritage associations in Edmonton. We have 80 plus international partners, increasing people and mobility and program cooperation, cultural exchanges and industry and innovation projects with global partners. The vision has always been to have comprehensive internationalization and this contributes directly to Concordia being Canada's preeminent small university. Now, Concordia has had an alumni liaison officer for, from faculty for over two years now. We're working closely with our alumni association executive and we're putting the finishing touches on our alumni database. We've sent out our first new yearbook called Inside Q to over 20,000 of our alumni. We have 20,000 alumni, it's kind of amazing. And are preparing an electronic version for the second edition. We launched a successful design competition for the new Concordia ring. And this elegant ring is really selling quite fast, so I advise you get yours. Uh, it is intended to be for all Concordia constituents and friends, as well as our alumni. And our senior administration has been visiting national and international alumni groups as we travel. And alumni class reunions are also being held at Concordia. Many of you know I just got back from Strasbourg. I had a great dinner with four uh, Concordia alums in Strasbourg in France. Like, fantastic to be able to meet with them. And they love Concordia. The research culture at Concordia continues to evolve and has had some strong developments over the past year. Increased numbers of applications to funding agencies have resulted in faculty receiving over $220,000 in external grant funding. Concordia received its first ever NSERC Discovery Grant, and that was thanks to Dr. Ha Tran in our Faculty of Science, with a novel mathematical approach to data equipment, uh, encryption. We've also received a Shirk Insight grant from Dr. Zravko Mar Mar Marjanovic, sorry, sorry Zravko for doing that, uh, to, uh, to address how responses to victims of natural disasters are determined. Dr. Brent Bradford uh, received an award from the Secretariat for Responsible Conduct of Research to attend the Sixth World Conference on Research Integrity. Now internally, Concordia continues to support research by faculty and students, both in terms of supporting new projects and dissemination within a limited budget envelope. Although I'd like to underscore that this envelope has increased significantly over the last year. Out of 55 applications for internally adjudicated grants, we awarded 22 to Concordia faculty and 12 to students for a total of over $60,000. Now, in April, we held our fourth annual research 
forum poster exhibition with participation from 66 faculty and students. This year, the event included our first annual poster competition with three merit-based prizes under two categories. The posters demonstrated the depth and breadth of innovative research being done at Concordia across all of our disciplines. Abstracts were compiled in a booklet and posted on our website. As of 2018, Concordia has 10 active interdisciplinary research clusters, the most recent being on machine learning and artificial intelligence. That was launched in December. And finally, the Gerald S. Crispin Research Award for 2019 was awarded to Dr. Brent Bradford from our Faculty of Education. I'll talk about some of the risks we face. Our main risks in the upcoming year are related to our growth. Now, while we anticipated solid growth over the past couple of years, the growth in students' numbers we have actually experienced has, of course, defied even our most optimistic expectations. And it's well above what the government of Alberta forecast. By the way, it is unique in Alberta. No other institution is growing the way we are growing. We are significantly higher than the next fastest growing institution. Um, academic, the, uh, so, <laughs> we are faced with campus facilities and um, staffing issues and struggling to meet the demands right now. Um, we're taking action to try to ameliorate and reduce these risks. We've commissioned our architect, uh, Janusz Narsfeld, to provide us with an updated campus master plan that takes into account the possibility of Concordia acquiring a portion of the exhibition lands, formerly Northlands, to the north of us. Now, this campus master plan will outline the facilities we will require as we grow and when and where they will need to be built. This is essential to have before we can start thinking about putting shovels in the ground. I know, know we need new buildings, but we need to know where and what before we, we start that. We are, however, already aware of the urgent need for dormitories, we have been for years, and a new academic building. Once we have a new campus master plan, we'll be able to embark on the design and construction of these buildings, which will likely need to be built simultaneously. That's going to be an interesting time at Concordia. Concordia's board has set aside some financial resources to help get us started on these projects. We've also set up a strategic enrolment management committee uh, to better manage our growth. And this does not mean necessarily restricting our enrolment growth, but rather managing it in a more deliberate way than we have done in the past. Engaging in strategic enrolment management should help us to continue to provide the quality student experience on which we've built our reputation. Financial risks remain ever present. Has any university anywhere in the world ever said they have enough money? The, or, or school? Uh, the rumours of government budget cuts to post-secondary uh, are real, although at the time of writing, we are unsure of what those might look like. As we grow in student numbers, a, co a, contraction, a contraction in financial resources will require careful management. We've mapped out a number of possible and likely budget reduction scenarios. We're confident that we're as prepared as we can possibly be for any scenario. But we have many areas of focus and opportunity. It's a wonderful time and this influx of students and prosperity uh, creates many opportunities for us. So our reconciliation work with the Indigenous communities continues to progress well. Uh, it's received a boost not only from the strong work of our elders and those connected with the IKRC, but also from our decision to hire two new faculty members to work in the area of Indigenous programming and research. We want to be a beacon for international students across the country as we honour their worldview, even as we continue to engage in the essential learnings inherent in our various academic disciplines. Opportunities continue to exist at the Northland site, and I'm working closely with our Chancellor uh, to move this forward as swiftly as possible with City Administration and Council. The sooner we're able to arrive at a conclusion on this site, the sooner we can move forward with other partnerships to make our expansion north a reality. The increase in student numbers provides momentum for program development. As we work towards full CAQC approval for our PsyD program, other opportunities are also being pursued, such as a Master of Science in IT. Attractive and varied courses and programs can be proposed that capitalise on the diverse student body that we've now attracted to our campus. Applications for external research grants seem to be increasing, and we look forward to supporting our faculty become even more engaged in externally funded research moving forward. 
because funded research is one metric by which the quality of universities are judged. And such funding snowballs, helping us to attract even more funding and providing even greater opportunities to our faculty and to our students. Our comprehensive international program also provides Concordia, Concordia with many opportunities. Students have virtually unlimited opportunities to engage in study abroad, and our faculty have similar opportunities to engage in international research partnerships. We're hoping for even greater engagement in this area in the coming year. So we continue to ride a wave of success at Concordia. And if I may stay with the surfing metaphor, we seem to be first on the wave and our wave selection has been impeccable. Our Board of Governors and General Faculties Council have ensured that we're surfing on a day that is optimal. The swell is good and the wind is offshore. They provided us with a reliable foundation on which we can thrive. But it is our faculty, staff and administration who have chosen the right set of waves on which to ride. And as a result, our institution and especially our students are cruising to success like never before. However, as any surfer knows, even in optimal conditions, sometimes rocks are lurking beneath the water and need to be avoided. Hitting a rock will ruin even the best day at the beach. For this reason, those of us surfing on this wave of success need to be mindful not to lose our heads. We need to stay alert at Concordia. We need to be measured in our actions and responses to the prosperity and the growth we're now facing. By doing this, we can hope to sustain our success and continue to fully enact our institutional mission, which is to be a community of learning grounded in scholarship and academic freedom, preparing students to be independent thinkers, ethical leaders, and citizens for the common good. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So maybe we'll... Thank you so much, President Lorman, for the robust and really thought-provoking presentation on where Concordia is at today. So we do have about five minutes for some questions of Dr. Lorman. And just a reminder, there's uh, two people in the audience with microphones. If you have a question, make sure you ask that into the microphone. No questions? <laughs> okay, if you think of another question or a comment that you'd like to share afterwards, please do email President Lorman at the president at concordia.ab.ca um, email. And just thank you again for, for attending, and uh, we just wish you a, a good rest of your day. So thank you. <laughs>